And so we begin. Good afternoon, everyone who is joining us today. We are so excited to have you. Uh, we have a, an amazing afternoon plan. So thank you for joining the episode two of Focus on Faith. This is the business of music publishing. And so today we are going to really get into some things that hopefully are going to just sort of expand your awareness, your knowledge, and also inspire you as to how, if you're a creator, that you can start to make money and do better business with your music. And if you're on the business side, learn a few more factoids about what's going on currently in the landscape, learn about these amazing panelists that we have and what they do, because there's some phenomenal and very, very, very interesting folks that are joining us today. And then we're also going to give you a chance to ask questions. Um, a little housekeeping, as they always say at the beginning of these things. I'm Heather Beverly. I'm the founder and CEO of the Soul Reciprocity Network. And I'm also an entertainment attorney of 20 something years. Mm -hmm. uh, and I decided when I launched this company, which is a branding and marketing and uh, strategic partnership company, that I wanted to make sure that we did edutainment components. And the edutainment components are things like this. Uh, virtual panels, discussions, there'll be one-on-ones, there'll be some other cool things that we'll be doing um, as the year goes on. But what I thought was really important was that we take a minute to make sure that we're all speaking the same language and take time to, you know, just get up to speed on what's happening in the business and how we can all be better. Because the Soul Reciprocity Network is really all about a couple of main things. Number one is serving people and our clients to really develop their brands, understand what they're doing and who they are and why and the bigger scheme uh, plan for it but also give them tools, both from an educa education standpoint, but also resources of people, places, and things that they need in order to succeed with their brands. And ultimately, you know, even though it's music or film or television or whatever part of entertainment you're in, it's the business. And so we make our living doing this. And many of us hope to make our living doing this. And so it's so important that we understand how to set the right foundation so that we're as best as we can be and then build upon that and reach out to people strategically that can assist us in, in getting to our goals and who also benefit from the fact that they're working with us. So this is a network, a company, a philosophy that is rooted in reciprocity. It's rooted in what you give out is what you get back and understanding that there's an ecosystem we can all live, exist, and eat within uh, if we do our work properly and foster the right kinds of relationships. So the housekeeping we have to do is that I want to, first of all, make sure all of you notice this is interactive. So we have chat activated. Um, and one of my producers has just sort of sent a welcome hello chat. So I don't know which way it is on yours. I guess it's this way. <laughs> but check out our chat. If you've got questions, put them in there. Even if we can't stop in that moment to ask to answer them, we're going to save time at the end so that the panelists can address your questions. And I might even be able to weave them in as we go. But either way, our producers will be making sure that you guys can see, um, that they can see what's going on and they can aggregate the questions for us. I also wanna thank very much our two charitable partners. You probably noticed that this event is free. I mean, if you were going to most music seminars or conferences, you'd probably have to pay some sort of an entrance fee. We're not asking that you do that, however, I told you it's the Soul Reciprocity Network. And so we partnered with some charities who are doing amazing things in the industry for us. So we are partnered with the James Brown Family Foundation who do amazing work in the education of people for people in music. Um, and so we are taking donations partially for them and it'll support their efforts in music education, which again is so, so very important. We've also partnered with the Gospel Music Association. And so a portion of our proceeds are also going to be 
uh, sent to them. Why? Because they have a ton of activities that they do in support of the gospel music industry. And you see that this series is to focus on faith. Um, and so part of what we're doing though, it's a lot of general information about the industry and we're incorporating people from all aspects, but we are really focusing on what's going on in the faith-based content creation industries and how are opportunities growing as this world continues to evolve in a genre that I think sometimes people aren't really looking at as much as they should or might miss or people within it don't realize how big a world there is for us to tap into and really find uh, some interesting things to do creatively. So please, if you didn't, you didn't have to, but if you didn't take a minute, just hit that donate button, you guys. There's no you know, right or wrong answer, but just contribute to these great organizations because they're the ones who are doing things like creating artist funds during COVID that will people can apply for grants. And if you got hit with touring or something like that, there's money for you at the GMA with that program and they do so many more. So help us out and make sure you support our partners. Okay, Whew. enough of that. So we're going to start and uh, I want to always ask, and I'm going to, so this is going to help me know who saw the chat room and who's playing along nicely. I like to find out who we're talking to. I mean, this world of virtualness is uh, got us all feeling really disconnected. And so just want to take a little survey of the room and see, like, let us know if you are an artist, if you're a songwriter, a producer, uh, or if you're on the business side of the industry, maybe you're an executive, a lawyer, an accountant, a manager, or a company owner, type in the chat room and let us know so we can make sure that we also direct some of our information specifically to you and your needs. We're being interactive, waiting, waiting. Woo! All right. And I'm not about really doing the shout out thing, but you know, Tabitha Plumber Esquire is in the building. So we definitely know we have powerful attorneys in the room. And I see, uh, uh, we've got accountants and actually this particular accountant, Keith Towns is an accountant to numerous artists, entertainers and uh, professional athletes. Y'all might meet some people in the chat room that you might wanna get to know, I'm just saying. Uh, so welcome to all of you and thank you for joining and letting us know who you are. Now, speaking of who you are, I'm gonna be quiet for a minute only because it's not about me. It's about these amazing people who I've got to join me today for this panel. Um, we have on the panel five industry phenoms. And I am so excited, not only because they are representative of such a wide array of success in our business, but because I can call each of them personally a friend and a colleague. So I can't tell which way you guys are looking, but I'm going to start to my left with Sue Drew. Now, Sue, who, you know, I try not to tell personal stories all the time and I'm not going to, I promise I won't, but Sue and I have gotten to know each other really well as of late. Um, at, she is at Cobalt. Uh, music publishing, and she's a cre she's the manager of creative, manager of all of creative for the United States and beyond at Cobalt. And we have done some deals together. She's given me advice. Uh, she's just a tremendous, tremendous asset to that team. And I just personally want to say to my sister Sue, thank you for being here. Um, Sue oversees the U.S. creative team and her signings at Cobalt include artists and writers like hmm, Lionel Richie, maybe you've heard of him, just saying. Uh, Benj Pasek, Justin Paul, writer for La La Land and uh, The Greatest Showman, uh, Katie Ulich, uh, Jared Lilo, Lainey, Evan Bogart, who I, is an amazing producer. Uh, she previously served as Senior Vice President of Membership and Vice President of Membership in Pop and Rock uh, for ASCAP. And she spent nearly 20 years in a &R, uh, having signed artists like Fish, uh, They Might Be Giants, and Michelle Schacht. Her career is vast. She's got 
boots on the ground experience and high, high level executive experience. And I'm so glad to have you, Sue. Thank you. Thank you, Heather, for having me. Absolutely. And then I'll go right next door. <laughs> I feel like we're in like Hollywood squares. And I know I just dated myself because no one knows what that is. But, you know, let's go to Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan Feingold and I have also had the pleasure of doing some business together, especially in recent history. And um, I find him, his company and what he does absolutely fascinating. And a lot of you might not even realize that the types of things that Jonathan and his licensing and publishing company do. But he's the founder of Fine Gold Music. It's a music licensing and publishing company, as I said. He represents a lot of indie labels and artists and publishers, uh, including Westbound, which has Funkadelic, Anderson Pack, Dram, Eminem. His licensing work has been heard in ads for Apple. Listen close, folks iPhones, Nike, Spotify, Cadillac, and more. He's done movies and television, uh, trailer work like on Furious 7, The Big Short, Moneyball, and lots more. Homeland, Made Men, Narcos, Westworld, The Shy. Jonathan's work is uh, amazing. It's helpful, it's innovative. Uh, he knows how to integrate music into television and film and other content and finds amazing opportunities for his clients. And I'm so glad to have you here, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you. Miss Brandra, I would really take up too much time if I gave background with Miss Brandra since uh, we met in Chicago long. I mean, it really can't be that long ago because she's 12, but a while ago, I was grown, she was not, but that's okay. Uh, but Brandra is the, I'm just so proud because I've seen, I've seen her career grow and blossom and it's just, it's incredible. Brandra is the senior director of Urban a r at Warner Chapel Music Publishing. Uh, she joined the company in 2016 and she signed and worked with many multi-platinum writers uh, and producers as a leading a &R executive in the industry, she was recently named one of Billboard's 2020 hip hop and R&B power players. And she was featured in Billboard's Women in Music 2020 issue. I'm so proud. <laughs> <laughs> Her current roster includes artists and writers and producers like uh, Diggy, written for Khalid and Normandy, Jay Lauren, who's written for Post, Post Malone, Ty Dolla Sign, uh, Tyler Lott Yahweh, Pierre Bourne, who's worked with Playboy Cardi, Travis Scott, Kanye West, Lil Uzi Burt, TNT, uh, NBA Young, Young Boy, and Ellie Chopper. So her writers and producers are making the hits that you all are hearing today, hence, one of Billboard's top women in music for 2020. Brandra Ringo, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Heather. I'm honored to be here with all of you guys. Thank you. Moving, not down, just over. <laughs> Fred Jerkins, I feel like we need to cue confetti, some horns and a Macy's Day parade balloon or two. Uh, the fact that, don't do it, the fact that you found any time uh, from your busy schedule, I don't know, but I'm grateful. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Fred Jerkins III is an accomplished, to say the least, songwriter and producer. He has worked with A-list artists um, that include everyone from Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, Beyonce, Destiny's Child, Mary J. Blige, Jennifer Lopez, Tony Braxton, Donnie McClurkin, Kirk Franklin, Yolanda Adams, just to name a few. Uh, he and his brother Rodney have one of the most successful production companies ever to grace this earth with Dark Child Records. Uh, he has received 21 Grammy nominations, five Grammy wins, numerous Dove Award nominations and wins, and he's received a ton of gold and platinum and multi-platinum awards totaling 
over 200 million in sales worldwide. I mean, what else do you say? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the illustrious Fred Jerkins. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Happy to be here today, absolutely. Just honored, thank you so much. Yes. And then my man C, <laughs> C Barrett, not last or least, but C and I met up. Again, he was a child uh, in Chicago a ton of years ago. And it's so funny because when I was looking for, I wanted to have somebody from BMI and I, I asked um, a very close friend of mine and he's like, you have to have C, he's the rock star. I'll introduce you. I'm like, I know C, you don't have to introduce me. <laughs> And so I'm really happy to have you here, C. Um, C. Barrett is the Director of Creative in Los Angeles for BMI, which is Broadcast Music Inc., for those of you who may not know. He is responsible for signing new and emerging talent in the R&B, hip-hop, and gospel genres. In addition, he maintains relationships with current affiliates and he curates interactive BMI events as the annual Know Them Now showcase. The How I Wrote That Song, which is one of my favorite series, uh, the Producer Talk series at BMI, and the Trailblazers of Gospel Music Awards, uh, uh, as well as an acoustic lounge, the R&B edition for BMI, and BMI stage at one music fest. So C has his hands in so many things. I can't wait for you guys to hear probably a lot of things you didn't know that people at BMI were doing and the other PROs, but C, Barrett, thank you so much for being here. Absolutely, great to be here. Thanks for having me. All right, enough of me talking. Y'all are sick of it, I know. And let's get to them. Um, I just wanna start this whole thing with a kind of a general question to everyone. Um, and because this is a focus on faith uh, panel and web series, let's just kind of talk for a minute about, you know, how do you guys see the industry generally opening up in terms of opportunities um, or uh, uh, opportunities and placements and different integrations of faith-based content into film, television, and other areas of the industry. Anyone want to start in particular with what they've been seeing? Trending? Jonathan, let's start with you. Well, it's happening. I think that that's the first thing. Um, I think that the, the timing of, uh, of our world and what's happening, people are seeking um, songs of inspiration. They're seeking, um, you know, sort of positive vibes and good energy. And I think that um, for me, I've noted that a lot of the evergreen songs in this world, um, in, in this gospel world have kind of come out. And I think the Clark sisters are probably one of the best examples of it in terms of um, you brought the sunshine into my life and, and songs along that line that are sort of non-denominational, um, but for sure have a gospel feeling to them and gospel spirit to them. Um, so I think the timing is perfect um, and it's, um, it's awesome. And it's awesome, I think, in the sync world when you start to um, open up different, different pathways, different roads and, and different styles. And, and frankly, in terms of a lot of other music that I'm hearing that's like double R rated and triple X rated. It's quite refreshing um, for me, me personally as an individual as well. And uh, I can't tell you like just in life, you know, working out at the gym and I'm hearing like language that it's like crazy. And all of a sudden when you hear an inspirational song and a positive song, it's like, yeah, this is what we need right now, you know? So that's, uh, that's great. Fred, you have made music in every genre just about possible. Are you finding yourself being either asked or collaborating with 
more artists than normal or anything new and interesting happening on the music that you're making in the faith-based industries? So, I mean, what I've been doing personally um, is really creating a lane for myself. Um, as you know, uh, with Jonathan Nelson, I uh, was part of a project that I did, a project of healing, which I did in 2000. Well, we released it in 2018. And um, so that was, a, that was a compilation album, you know, with a bunch of different artists, featured artists on that project. So um, I did like the way um, things turned out with it and, and the response that we were getting from individuals. I mean, that was a project uh, with the calls based on um, so touched a lot of lives. So I received a lot of great feedback from that. Um, and that kind of drove, you know, drove me to, to continue what I was on with that. Um, so I've been recording mm -hmm. with different artists, you know, just and bringing things out periodically, which is awesome. Um, uh, people do still reach out. The pandemic kind of put, put things in a, in a weird space because we were in the process of starting to record and then not wanting to record. But um, actually, wow, um, we're actually scheduled in February for the first time, you know, since, since, since last year to record because I just didn't want to be in that space. Right. Yeah. Yep. So I'm excited. Awesome. Um, it's great. I, you know, it's, it's a great time. It's a great, it's a, it's a great time for artists in general right now, to be totally honest. So um, I'm looking forward to getting back in the studio with people and recording again. Mm, <laughs> I bet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Brantra, how is the landscape looking for opportunities for folks in multiple genres for you guys in yeah, the publishing world? Yeah, I think I'm starting to see a cool trend where like rappers are actually collaborating with gospel acts more often than normal. And they can accept it. And it's pretty cool to see because sometimes, you know, having genres and everybody put it in a box, you don't necessarily get to cross pollinate in the way that it needs to happen, right? In terms of being inspirational. And I think once we do cross paths from a spirituality perspective, you know, you see different lights and where people come from and their backgrounds. And, and then and then I think for so long the gospel industry was so strict that it was like, you can't sample music that's in a secular space. You can't do this, you can't do that. And now a lot of people are a lot more open and it's actually opening the doors so that people are open to actually like, you know, getting to know about spirituality in a different way. Yeah, I love that. Sue, well, you've got some cool stuff going on. <laughs> And Cobalt has quite a, a uh, gospel roster. In fact, C knows we were the gospel publisher of the year. But I think what's interesting to me is it's in a week and having many meetings with clients and prospective clients, I would say to you a good 50% of the people that come in have their foundation in the church. And that's where they've learned their music. And that's how they've taken that education and feel and inspiration and brought it into pop and R&B music. So it, it's a foundation. It's just one of the basis of the entire industry, in my opinion. Yeah. See, don't want to leave you out of that conversation. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think building on what Sue said, you know, so many of our producers, our, our you know, uh, musicians come out of the church, our singers, so, you know, that influence is all throughout music everywhere. You know, you, you can't get away from it. But um, I think just as, in far as, as far as the landscape goes, it's, it's, it's a great time, like Fred said, just for, for all music in general, but in, in particular gospel music to, to infiltrate other areas, um, you know, from what we're going through today, you know, we're in quarantine, content is king, people are looking for uh, other things to you know to watch and you know all different type of programming that 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 gospel music can be you know woven into so uh, also with the streaming world opening up you know that's that that's benefited uh the opportunities and, and the reach there too i think for gospel so i think that it's just you know about just being super creative and and really expanding on other opportunities like that i love it i love it so as you can see uh to our audience, there's there's a lot going on and there's a lot of business being done. And I think a lot more than people might always uh, expect. But what I do also wanna make sure we set the foundation for in a panel about music publishing is, what is music publishing? <laughs> what, what is it that yeah. we're really talking about here? And, and what is it that 
these people do for a living exactly when it comes to the creatives and writers and producers and so forth. Have being the resident Esquire on this particular panel, though also the host, I did want to make sure that I gave you guys sort of the really condensed version so that we're just all understanding what we're talking about. I think music publishing is so often a phrase thrown out there in, and everyone assumes they're supposed to know what does that really mean. Yet I find a lot of times uh, even very accomplished people don't fully understand what it is are we actually talking about. So look, in English, music publishing is the business of your songs. Okay, so what we're talking about here is what is going on, what's possible that can be done to make sure that your songs are protected, to make sure that uh, the songs that you write, you're monetizing and making money from, that you, it's collected upon, and what is it that you can do with your songs to sort of get them the most reach and the most results from multiple levels, obviously impacting as a creative and an artist, but also as a business, uh, how is it that the business is being handled with regard to your songs? So music publishing is the business of your songs. Start there. Well, your songs being what? What is it about them that have business involved, etc.? Look, you guys all have heard the word copyright and I'm not trying to offend anybody who's like, duh, of course we have. But I also find out that a lot of times people don't really get like, what is this tie about what is, if we're, if it's the business of my songs and I know that I have a copyright associated with my songs, what does that mean? So again, as simple as possible, cause you're not here for too much of this but you gotta get it to know the business. You have to understand that a copyright is this. If you have an idea for a song and you decide that uh, you wanna make it or make it, record it, do something. You're humming it, a melody, or you're thinking about some lyrics in your head. The moment that you actually bring what's in your head together and put it in a legal phrase, tangible form, you make it real, you record it, you write it down, you make it tangible. The minute you do that, you actually are the proud owner of something called a copyright. What it does is it says, look, now that you've created this thing and it's unique to you, you didn't steal it from somebody, but it's actually your original work or you and some other people's, you've created this thing called a copyright, which is now you have an ownership interest in the thing you just made. And if you think about it like a house, if you own a house, you're the one that gets to do stuff with your house. If you own it, you can rent it. You might paint it, you might add an addition to it. You just can do things to the house that as an owner, uh, uh, somebody else wouldn't be able to do. So you with your songs control, does it get copied? Does it get distributed? Does it get sold? Can somebody use it in TV? Can someone record it? It gives you the right to do stuff with it. Copyright, it's like the right to copy. So as the proud owner of a copyright comes obligation and responsibility. And so that's where the business of handling these copyrights comes from. You can register them with the copyright office that lets everybody on the world on notice that it's yours and when you made it. Uh, and you can do other things, which is what we're talking about today. So that's literally all I'm gonna give you. You'll have to come to part 2.0 and 3.0 when I bring in Miss Plummer Esquire and a bunch of other of my really cool legal friends and we'll all like give you the whole thing uh, in more detail. But just know what we're talking about today, guys, is what's the business of the songs you're creating and how do you make this a career? How do you make money? How do you end up with a Michael Jackson record and, and clients like these people have? Okay, so let's go. Uh, Brandra, let me start with you. So we said that copyrights and, and, is, and music publishing is the business of songs, but you work for one of the largest music publishing companies on the planet. What does that really mean you do as a company and you in particular as a head of A&R? 
Well, I think as a company, it's pretty traditional in terms of what we do and like administering everything that you just said pretty sums up the definition of administering the copyrights, right? Like you do have to collect and you have to license and that's all a part of being a music publisher traditionally. But the cool part about being a publisher also is that we get to do fun things. Like we get to set up sessions we get to identify talent at an early age and develop it, you know, and sometimes that happens before label A&Rs discover it. And so we're in a we're in a phase where we can actually nurture things, not 100% of the time, but that's the really cool part. And then my favorite part is putting people together that never knew each other or figuring out a sound that supplements another sound, them creating that, and then it hitting the airwaves or it hitting streaming services and it's out to the masses. That's the coolest part about it is that we get to be creative and we get to be artists in our own way. That's awesome. And like, how do you find your writers and producers? Like, how do you find people to sign? Um, anyway, like there is no traditional way to find someone. I mean, I find a lot of people by word of mouth. I find people from research. I find people from being in studio sessions. Um, there's no really, there's no real particular way. Like any way that a writer exists is, you know, we have the ability to find them. We find people at an early stage, like I just said, and they may not have cuts that are out and they may have cuts that are out. So it just depends on how passionate we are about their talent and their skill set, and also their work ethic. And so what are like in particular, are you looking for in, you know, that makes somebody viable or worthy of being signed to your company? I'm always looking for different things. I'm always looking for what loop, what, what holes we have in our roster because we all have some of the same type of talent, right? But sometimes you may need the, a top line writer that you keep getting requested for and you don't have it. So I'm always looking for a songwriter, like a top line writer, right? Cause I have so many producers and my producers do a lot of the same things and some of them do some very different things, but um, finding like a songwriter that has um, equal melody as they do lyrics. Sometimes it's tough, you know, there are not as many writers. So it just depends on what the marketplace is like. It also depends on hearing something that you feel like is unique and you feel like that could be the new wave as well. So there is no real set, set you know, thing that I'm always looking for. It just really depends on the landscape and I guess where I am mentally and creatively. Got it. And so in that realm, Hey, you have any great or fun or interesting new signing stories? Oddly, no, I don't. Fun? <laughs> um, I don't know. Or okay, success so success stories you're proud of? Believe it or not, I just signed my first female writer. Jay Lauren, who you mentioned, who writes, who's the only female writer who works with Post Malone. She wrote Goodbyes for Post Malone featuring Young Thug. That is my first woman. I can't believe it. That just happened in 2020. I'm actually ashamed about it. But um, <laughs> yeah, I'm very excited about her. She is the most incredible being like I've met in a long time. She's super talented. Her work ethic is crazy. She can write in any genre ever. And she, she's amazing. So I'm very excited about her. Um, she's got a lot of cool things coming too. I've introduced her to a lot of cool people, which is like I said before, the fun part about it. But, um, you know, I was also a part of a great signing last year, which was signing that boy Squeeze, who created Roddy Rich's The Box, which was the biggest song of 2020. And I'm very proud of that because they took me through the ringer. Um, I don't know how many times I went to Atlanta to try and sign him, but I mean, it was like, Ryan's like, don't come back if you don't get this signing. <laughs> <laughs> and and so, Ryan would say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, literally, he sent me from the office to the airport and I was like, Ryan, I got to go home and pack. He's like, I'll buy your clothes when you get there and just go. <laughs> get her done. Get her done. It's great to hear that there's still a and r going on in the world. I think people thought it was a lost art form for a long time. And I will say, having worked with you with some of my clients too, that you really do that work. Like you get to know them, you go and see them if they're performers, you get in the studio. And I really did think a lot of that was a lost art. So it's just, it's refreshing. It's so, not 
I, I think, oh, sorry. I think a lot oh, of us the public inside all come from music. Like we're all either former songwriters or we were into music in some way. So it makes a lot of sense for us. I was talking to a and &R, a label a and &R yesterday. And he was just saying that he has learned his skill set in terms of putting songs together from publishers, not people on the label side. Mm -hmm. And so I think we all take great pride in that. And so I, I love that part about publishing the most. Like it's not a lost art form. I don't think it will ever be. That's great. So Sue, speaking of, we'll just stick with the girl power thing since <laughs> we're celebrating Brandra's first female signing. I'm going to go straight over to Sue <laughs> because Cobalt, similar in some respects to what Warner Chapel does, is an administration company. Uh, what is it that Cobalt does? So there are, generally speaking, two types of publishing deals you can do. One is a co-publishing deal, where the publisher will pay you money to have 50% ownership of your publisher's share for an extended period of time. And the other is an administration deal, where you keep ownership of your copyright, but the administrator takes a fee for their efforts. Cobalt was started about 20 years ago as an administrator only. We don't do any co-publishing deals. So every client of Cobalt owns their copyrights for as long as they decide to. And, but much like Warner Chapel and the other major publishers, we are a full creative service at Cobalt. Because every client is admin, every client gets the benefit of the creative team. So, you know, we work, it, there's a little bit of another difference I think I should explain, and that is we work very collaboratively at Cobalt. In most publishing companies, the publisher signs a client and that goes on their roster and they have their roster of clients and they look at that roster every day, every week and decide who they're going to, you know, how they're going to help each of these people. And at Cobalt, we don't have rosters. We are a collective of everybody collaborating together. It can be a little tricky sometimes, but but the the point is that you get the the client gets the best of the company because I may know people that my colleagues don't know, they know people I don't know. I have ideas in my head they wouldn't have, vice versa. <laughs> so we all kind of pitch in together. Um, that's not to say we don't sign people individually, and we all know who we've signed. I mean, we all are proud of the people we've brought in, but. We just feel that it's a really great, a great way to handle handle the creative communities, give them everything possible, and and also globally. We we work differently in that regard too because we have one bottom line for the company. There's not there's offices all around the world, but they don't operate independently as independent businesses. It all funnels into the same pot, so there's no competition, which is really a very nice thing. But yeah, I mean, we register your copyrights. We look for licensing opportunities. We do a lot of collaborations as a, as a creative team and a lot of um, international with US collabs. And honestly, this pandemic has been, it's been amazing in a lot of ways. My, my team is more connected now over this past year than they ever have been because we're all on Zooms together every day. I mm -hmm. see the New York office, the Nashville office, our Atlanta office. And, and we, we really feel that we're a team and it's been amazing. And for co-writes too, you can be anywhere in the world. We're setting up yeah. a session with someone in LA and someone in Armenia next week. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, doesn't matter. Right. Now, what I love about what you've said and also what Brandra said, and it's so on point, is that a lot of times you as executives come from a creative world. You come from a being either, you know, actually being artists, writers, producers, or having worked in other capacities, not executive uh, in a company. I mean, like, so what do you actually do at Cobalt as the director of creative for the United States of America. And what gave you the, the uh, foundation to have such a great job? Well, I'm old. That's the first thing. I've been around <laughs> a long time. I've had a lot of jobs. I started as a, a classical musician. I was a viola player. That's what I went to college to do was to be a classical violist. 
And while I was in college, I discovered discovered that that life really wasn't for me, just sawing away in the practice room by myself. No, so I just decided I would work for a record company. And so somehow it happened. I didn't know anyone. It's just fate, life. It gets in, you know, it interferes with everything, and then you have to just sort of prove yourself as you go along. So honestly, it's just been many, many years of doing A and R working at ASCAP, managing people, learning uh, who all the songwriters were in, in the community and um, knowing people in the industry, I guess. And so I was at ASCAP for four years uh, running the, the uh, membership there and um, at the end. And uh, Willard Audritz who founded Cobalt asked me to come over to Cobalt. And in all, all honesty, there wasn't a specific job for me. He just wanted me to come to the company. And I was very excited to do that because it was a 13 year old company and very innovative. And that excited me. I loved ASCAP, it was amazing, but it's a hundred year old company. So it was very <laughs> different philosophies of, of thought. So I think, it, I just think it's years of experience, right? So what I do is I have a team of people around the country and I uh, oversee their efforts. I help them with their, their signings. I am, you know, the right hand for the global head of creative. She oversees all the international offices. And my day consists of mentoring my team and signing talent and mentoring that talent if they're young and developing, which is awesome. the most exciting thing, of course, when you can discover young people and bring them to the world. That's, that's the biggest high you can get in this business, I think. That's amazing. And so what would you say is like one of the just I like I like war stories or just kind of fun little factoids like what's one of your maybe biggest hits that you were involved in in the catalog? Uh, well, honestly, it, it happened just a few years ago. Um, I also happen to love musical theater. It's just something I like. And I like the new guard of musical theater, which is very innovative and exciting and pushing boundaries, sometimes more than I think pop music does. So I had met these two young writers, uh, Benj Pasek and Justin Paul, Pasek and Paul, when I worked at ASCAP and they were in their early twenties. And um, they were looking for a new publisher. They had had a previous publisher and they came to see me. And um, at the time they were auditioning to write the lyrics for La La Land they were auditioning to maybe do the music for The Greatest Showman. And they mm. had an off-Broadway show called Dear Evan Hansen. And I just went to SAS Metcalf, who's the chief creative officer. And I said, these guys are super talented. I, I just want to give them a deal. It's not even a business Cobalt was in. <laughs> we were not doing, I mean, we had a couple of things. That was it. So she said, sure. And we signed them for very little. And then within a year, a year and a half, they won an Oscar, they won mm. Grammys, they won Tonys. I mean, they're, they're probably, you know, well, they're certainly in the top five to 10 of our top clients. Yeah. And so the Greatest Showman album became the number one selling record of 2018 or 20, it was huge globally. I mean, huge, these are two musical theater. <laughs> And so you just, but the point of it is, is talent. If people have mm -hmm. talent, they will eventually deliver for you because that's who they are. Yeah. And, uh, so that's my favorite, obviously my favorite story. <laughs> well, and what I love about that is because it's an example of another area of music that people I think overlook or don't realize the monster potential that there is within it with musical theater. I mean, I think with Hamilton and some of the bigger shows that have kind of crossed over into, um, you know, kind of mainstream, uh, there's more examples of it, but that's what I think I'm loving about the industry right now is there's just no rules and it doesn't matter. You can be true to whatever type of music you're making and find opportunities for yourself. Um, Fred, you, sir, within what? The first two years of your career making music, you signed a seven figure publishing deal? What, what, what was that about? Um, you know what, we, when we started working, doing, you know, working with a lot of artists very quickly. So um, 
you know, not that it was the smartest move. No. Uh, at the time. <laughs> say that again. Years. You're kind of faint. I can't hear you. Did you yeah, say you not know, that it was the smartest? I guess move? when you haven't, you know, when you haven't seen the checks like that in life, then it, you know, it looks very great. Um, but it, not really the best, best situation. You know, I'll leave it at that. But um, <laughs> but I was very happy at the time. It, it it literally enabled me to do a lot of things. So I was very happy at the time. Yeah. yeah. So what were the hits that precipitated these this type of an opportunity for you? Well, you know what, what, what was like probably, that. you know, there were songs in the pipeline, but at that time we were, you know, uh, we were currently working with Brandy and we were doing the whole album, the whole Never Say Never album. So mm -hmm. there was a lot of hype. So you back back in at that time, like of course they would look at the pipeline and they would look at who you were working with and what they thought it would be, you know, mm -hmm. what kind of um, you know, income could be generated from it. So um, you kind of jumped on the hype and made it happen. Yeah. That's and, um, you know, of course it was very, you know, it was worth worthwhile for them at that time. It was a f uh, famous music publishing who was eventually bought out by Sony. Um, yeah, but it, it was a worthwhile deal for them to do. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> for them. And here's what I love because yes, we have people from all aspects of the business on the panel, but we have people from all aspects of the business who are here and watching you guys. And so I love to know from the creative's perspective, especially if you're kind of like, eh, maybe shouldn't have done that. So what would you think? Because one thing I think a lot of people don't know about you, sir, is how informed you are about this business and the mm -hmm. fact that you do conferences and workshops and even one-on-one -on -one mentoring with writers and producers on the business of it. It was just, it's incredible. So what do you think you learned from the first deal? People always hear like, eh, I probably shouldn't have done it, but why would you say that? Tell us, you know, we wanna that, know. That was later, again, <laughs> that was later down, down the road. I mean, my story is again, and well, I've told my story at the end of the day. So, I mean, if you're, generating income, you know, a publisher will continue to give you checks. You know, and so my story was, I was liking the, the, the checks, these advances. And at that time, I was like, okay, I just wanted, I wanted to keep getting these big checks, not realizing that all I was doing was put myself, you know, in a deal for a longer period of time for a check that was already going to be earned in the next three months. You know what I'm saying? So the, the money was there. They were just giving me stuff that was already coming to them and they could see it. Mm -hmm. So again, that extended a, a deal a lot longer than I probably should have been in it. Um, right. But again, you do things, you know, you do things what makes sense for you at, the, at that moment. I mean, so it, it made sense. I had um, mm -hmm. prior to that, um, where was I living prior to that, that check? I mean, I was living in a, you know, in a condo in Jersey. I bought myself a nice house afterwards um, and I was comfortable. So you can't slight, again, you have to do deals that make sense at that times, you know, again, it's 20 plus years later, um, it's a different situation. Um, but again, getting involved with it, um, I spent a lot of time educating myself because I wanted to know, okay, what is this publishing deal all about, right? Mm -hmm. oh, what is publishing all about? And I remember I would go to the office and um, the guy that signed me was a guy, uh, Brian P. And he would, he would come in, I would go in and talk to him. He'd be like, man, you learn an awful lot around here. You learn a lot. And I felt that I had to. Um, but I think it's important for individuals to know what they're doing. I think, you know, we rely on our attorneys to tell us and, and, and if they don't, um, then you're left out there, you know, on your own. So I think, you know, my situation back then, maybe my attorney wasn't knowledgeable enough or, you know, didn't care to tell me the different sides of ways that, I, that we could have did it. Mm -hmm. But I know one thing, if I would have did it different, I would have made a lot more money. Um, you know, not that I didn't make a lot of money, but I would have made a lot more. Two hundred million in sales, yeah. 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 Totally, so you, it would have been, you know, dramatically different. You know, yeah. if I did a deal like if, if I did an admin deal back then, what? <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Okay. So, do you have a publishing company or admin company now? Are you in a deal? Yeah. It's your yeah. I see some, yeah. I see a big smile. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so it's um yeah, and it's it's real important. You know what? So a lot of people will shy away from you know doing whatever, whether whether it's co-pub or admin, they don't understand how important it is. 
Mm-hmm. So if, if you if if you are right, it's beyond important to make sure you're um, with the PRO and as well. And, that, and some people get confused. They think, you know, if you're signed to ASCAP or BMI, that's a publishing deal. That's not. That's that's mm-hmm. totally different. So it's really important for writers to understand the difference and make sure you're signed with the PRO as well as, you know, I think it's important to be with the publishing company for admin or co-pub or whatever it is, because your money will be way out there and out of space and you're not even getting it because you can't possibly collect mm-hmm. from all these different territories without it. So, so got it. So you, you still have one because they're the ones that are helping you collect this money all over the world that there is and get all the bags that there are to get. Uh, mm-hmm. worldwide that you couldn't get yourself. Mm-hmm. But if I heard you correctly, what you kind of felt was a mistake in the early days was just chasing the advances that had to be paid back. And since you started the deal off in the negative, it just kind of takes that much more time to move along. Am mm-hmm. I saying that right? Am I yeah, hearing yeah, you right? Sure. That's true, yep. Just takes a little longer to get there. So this is what I really want to know. And I think a lot of people would love to know and maybe haven't asked. When you get that first big hit, and I don't know, I'll let you store a, one of your first big hits because I feel mm-hmm. like you had all of them all at the same time. The first was like, yeah, you had the whole charts. But when you get one of those first big songs, like mm-hmm. what did you realize about the impact of that money now coming in? Like what surprised you about where it was coming from or how it was being made? Were you surprised or... What did you just kind of learn from the first big hit? I think I was more so, not where it was coming from, but more so surprised the amount of money that could be made, right? And I, I, I'll give you an example. Um, I remember the boy is mine. I'm a spreadsheet guy, so I do spreadsheets for everything. everything. I love a and, spreadsheet. Um, yes, I do. <laughs> and I remember with the boy is mine, which, you know, there was, you know, several writers on that song. So again, it, it's chopped up and, I, when I you know, did this spreadsheet and now I'm looking at my statements, I'm digging my statements up from Famous and BMI and just plugging in the money that was being made. I, I literally was, blo- I'll be honest, I was blown away. I was blown away. I could not believe that one song could do what that song did. And mind you, well, I mean, it was number one for 13 weeks on um, the Hot 100. So it was, it was, a, it was a big record. And where was there any one revenue stream or a couple revenue streams that you would see? Because your statements will break down what where each dollar is coming in from, whether it was from the radio or whether it was from this actual, I mean, boys mine, physical CDs, mm-hmm. <laughs> or right. you know, or was there a big, you know, Super Bowl ad or like was there any particular place that money came in that you were like, oh, well, I mean I that didn't was, know. Yeah, definitely on the performance side for that song. You know, so you know, again, um, the sales was good still as well, but you know, the performance was crazy. So the radio airplay did it for it. Got it. So I actually think that I'm going over to see because you mentioned several times that PRO and I was looking at my BMI checks and the performance side, and that is like no, I mean, I couldn't set that up better if I scripted you. So I mean, C, you work for a performing rights organization Mm -hmm. uh, and and you work for BMI. And I think just like people hear the word publishing, people hear the word copyright, they think they know, but kind of they don't. What the heck is BMI? What do you do? It looks, sounds impressive to me, but what do you guys do? Yeah, uh, well, we are a, a, a performer rights organization, a PRO for short, as, as everyone will always, you know, uh, call us. And we're, we're one of four uh, in the U.S. at the moment. Who knows if that'll grow in the future. But uh, basically, at the foundation of what we do is when you uh, are a participator in a song or a participant in a song, whether you're the producer, you're the writer, um, you know, composers we deal with as well. Our, our job is when you affiliate with us to pay you performance royalties when that song gets performances, right? So we consider performances just plays, basically, fancy word for plays, whether that be on radio, traditional uh, radio, um, streams, um, you know, companies, uh, restaurants, bars, elevators, airplanes, stadiums, you know, we, we have licenses in place with these organizations 
And, um, you know, when, when uh, you get performances, we're charged to pay you for that at your correct percentage in a nutshell. That's the foundation of what we do. Um, there are different arms to, to a PRO, of course. You know, we have our licensing department who puts those licenses in place, who are in contact with the companies. Um, you know, have our distribution department who makes sure they get you your checks and your money, you know, correctly and on time. Um, and then, you know, where I, where I sit is the creative department. So uh, I like to uh, think that we have the most fun, <laughs> you know, <laughs> of the whole company, but we just definitely were the front forward facing um, people that, that deal with the writers, the composers, the producers uh, on a day to day. And, and um, you know, we're not a publisher, we're not a label, we're in a very unique space. And, you know, we, we, they like to call us uh, Switzerland, you know, because we're, we're, we're the creator's friend, you know, we're, <laughs> we're, we're pro creator in everything, you know, so mm -hmm. you, you're, you, we're a good resource uh, for, for many different things, depending on where you are in your career. Uh, it's our job in the, on the creative team to, to, you know, forge a relationship with you and cultivate uh, and walk along with you in your career as much as you will allow us to in general. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we provide different programming um, from, you know, a songwriter that started six months ago, you know, all the way up to, you know, the hit songwriter who's got several, you know, number ones, you know, just depends on where you are and where we fit and how we can be of assistance, you know, it's a true partnership just overall. Um, you know, we, we also like our, our big marquee uh, event every year is our award shows for each genre where uh, we award the top songs of the previous year, uh, you know, the publishers, the writers, and with a, with a big elaborate, you know, show because, you know, they don't get the shine that the artists <laughs> do all the time on, on, on the Grammys and, you know, the American Music Awards and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. our partners, which are, you know, our publishers, our, our writers, our composers, we we always award them every year uh, for their work. So that that's a big marquee event of ours. Um, so that's on, the, on a larger scale, that's that. But then maybe on a smaller scale, we, we, we provide programming such as, you know, different panels and, um, we have a cool, unique thing that we call speed writing for song, uh, speed dating for songwriters, where it's it's you know speed dating format as you know it, but just for songwriters. You sit across from each other, we'll play each other's music, we'll listen, see if there's synergy there, you know, can exchange contacts, and hopefully you know you all will work together in the future. So it's a, we really promote collaboration in, in all of our different events that we do, and um, yeah, we we just like to be accessible and and. Um, we get a lot of things early as well. I know Brandra mentioned that early, um, earlier on when she was speaking. And I think sometimes, a lot of times, PROs are, are in a uh, creator's first stop, you know, so we probably get it a little earlier than when they get on a publisher's radar a lot of times. So our relationships with, you know, the Sues and the Brandra's and other, other you know, label A&Rs are crucial because, you know, we uh, you know, exchange information and, and you know, sometimes I'll let her know, sometimes she'll let me know stuff and you know, that, that partnership is just uh, crucial just to the uh, overall landscape. So, um, yeah, so in, in a nutshell, <laughs> that, that's us, but yeah. So, so if I'm a writer or a producer, mm -hmm. I could maybe hope that Brandra or Jonathan or Sue sign me and find me and sign me, but then I can also be with you too? Yes. Yes. So, so how do I how do I make sure since you're you say you're collecting for this performance mm -hmm. of my music, radio and streaming and elevators and such. So <laughs> how how is it that I would become affiliated with you so you could do that for me? Right. So there's a it's a simple thing. We have an open door policy. So you can literally just go on BMI.com and sign up with us, you know, by filling out an application right? Mm -hmm. Just your basic information and, you know, you're, you're affiliated with us. Now, the most important part of that is you have to register songs. Once you get affiliated, <laughs> you have to register those songs within our system so that we know that they exist right. to pay. You. So, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, don't know that part, don't understand that part. They just think they can sign up and then it's up to us to do everything else. But, you know, if you don't register the song, we don't know it exists. So uh, we have we have you know portals online for you to register your songs, and uh, you know build your catalog within our system um, to to make sure that you are paid properly. Um, that's the one way, right? That's the everyone 
it's a free for all, you know, anyone can join it. It will come one, come all kind of thing. Now, the other aspect to that is what we, what we call as a signing, which is not a lot of people, you know, think that PROs can sign people, right? But um, we can, it's a lot smaller competition pool, but we do have competition. So, um, you know, when uh, an artist gains a certain amount of notoriety and, and they've got something moving, uh, you know, our competitors want them, we want them to be in the family. So, you know, that's when we bring in lawyers and managers and, and everything else, business managers to start. And you run to the airport with Brandra. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Exactly. When Wardell sends you, let's go <laughs> exactly. get the signing. <laughs> exactly, we're moving like that. So, so you know, it's 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 a much on, on a little smaller scale because we only you know um, deal with one part of the royalty stream, the performance royalties. But it's still super important to us that that we have those affiliations as well, just to to keep everything moving and to be competitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I love that. So. Since you do signings mm -hmm. and since you're like a director of creative, like what's one of your most exciting signings of late or not? Um, I'll, can I say two? You can say <laughs> whatever you like. <laughs> probably probably um, one, probably after my first year there, um, SZA was one of my signings, right? I was very excited about her. Uh, she was, you know, she, people in the industry had known about her, right? But she wasn't a household name, but I just always thought she was super dope. So when I found out, you know, she was available, you know, to, to be signed, <laughs> I went after her hard and, and it wasn't the easiest thing because her camp, the TDE, the Top Dog Entertainment guys are, are they move in a very unique way, <laughs> you know, and and so I had to approach it and be very strategic and, and use my relationships here and there and go through the back door, mm -hmm. try to, you know, so when we got that done, when I, uh, with, with her team, that was, I was very proud of that. And then she went on to have the big year um, with, with the control album and everything. Yeah. And I think she'll, she's someone who, you know, will be around for, for a nice career, you know, not just a, a hot moment. So she was very uh, exciting for me. And then uh, fast forward a couple of years, I used to hear about this girl who was making a lot of noise in Houston. And um, I was like, you know, I was really looking at her before the world got, uh, uh, you know, uh, got to know right. her. And I was like, hmm, I like this girl. She's making a lot of noise. I want to go after her. So I, I signed her for nothing, you know, um, or I affiliated her, I would say at this point, um, just my projection thinking that she was gonna, you know, be pretty big. Uh, a year later, her song hit, uh, and it was Megan Thee Stallion. So, and she's, you know, still, still doing her thing and still ascending. Oh, her. Even up, oh yeah, her. You know, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the female rappers, and they're having a, a great moment right now. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So she was another one I was excited about because, again, it was super early for the world, but mm -hmm. I got to get in on it early, and then, you know, uh, uh, she, we know her as we know her today. Right. Yeah. So that's fantastic. So we've talked about the fact that this business of copyrights is the business of your songs and you can find publishers at certain points in your career or they'll find you really more often than not, like uh, Brandra and Sue to come and start handling business for you and collaborate, getting you into collaborations and helping you register and keep your works organized as well as collecting the money for you and things like that. And we know that there's money from selling the records. Fred taught us that well. Uh, and the performance, which you just talked about from radio and all of that. And I think I can't wait to talk to Jonathan because what I love about the work he and I particularly do together is this whole area of sync licensing. So first of all, and we're gonna, we're going to talk to Jonathan and then we are going to get to your questions. So I hope that for those of you who have not been over, over there in the chat, that you queue up some questions for us. But Jonathan, first of all, everybody's throwing this word around license. And I'm going to tell you, you know, I like to think that some of these things on the wall, uh, pieces of paper that say I'm educated mean I'm supposed to have some level of intellect. But even as an attorney, when I first started out doing entertainment, 
I, I don't know why I just couldn't wrap my mind around the word license. It just always stuck me, got me stuck. So I started remembering it the best by just telling myself it's a permission slip. So if I own a song and I want, and I'm going to let somebody do something with my property, I have to give them a permission slip in order for them to use it in different ways. Now you're a publisher, an administrator, and a licensing company, and you sir, are an amazing sync agent for synchronization licensing for putting music and film and TV. Please tell the people <laughs> what your company does and what you do as an agent. So around 15 years ago um, or so, um, we got asked by a British, um, a British dance hall label um, called Greensleeves, known for Shaggy and Mr. Vegas and Yellow Man, to, um, to help them in the States on um, um, helping get some of their hit records into movie and TV opportunities. And at that point, they had this rhythm called the Diwali Rhythm, and Sean Paul's Get Busy and Wayne Wonders No Letting Go were starting to go up the charts um, big time and they were looking to exploit it and they had never had a sync as a company. And so I felt that there was a niche to represent independent companies, independent small publishers, old catalogs um, and super indie and up and coming labels that didn't have um, their own sync departments. And at this point, um, most of the large companies um, were reactive and not proactive. And so we felt if we were proactive and could represent a lot of the smaller companies that didn't have their own in-house departments, that we could fill a nice um, niche in the industry. And so for a decade, quietly, we started to, you know, we represented a lot of labels um, and publishers and artists directly and started to um, build um, a stream, a nice stream of income for these artists and for these copyrights. And, and you know, and, and I went out to Hollywood and sort of had a lot of powwows with music supervisors and they put me under their wing and they explained to me some of the terms that is sort of second nature now, like one stops and things like that. And they kind of teed me up and sort of explained things to me. And, and then I would say around a year later, I was heading to Medem and on my flight was an old college roommate from NYU and his wife happened to manage George Clinton. Mm -hmm. And so George was on the flight unbeknownst Andy. to me. And I met him um, collecting luggage. And then he had a lot of his music um, coming back to him rights wise. And so that became our next client. And we sort of built up this nice niche in certain genres that were not necessarily mainstream genres. And, and then only in the last, I'd say five years or so, seven years, give or take, the big companies have really you know, built up their armies and have really become super proactive about synchronization. And it's an area in the music industry that um, has two, sort of major um, bonuses. And one is the income that it makes and synchronizations um, for big time brands and big ads can pay upwards of, you know, sometimes a million dollars, but typically more in a half a million to a million dollar range for big ads, big Super Bowl ads and things like that. And then the other bang you get is marketing. Um, some syncs in the right TV shows um, in the right ads um, really uh, have a lot of value. Um, typically like a song in an Apple commercial um, or a song in a, um, in like a Sex in the City or something that really has an impactful um, creative sort of uh, pop culture vibe to it really, you know, has um, an influence. And so people come to us to work their titles and their, and their copyrights and their masters sort of with those two things in mind. Um, ways to re-generate um, older um, evergreen songs and be people like we represent Kid and Play. And all of a sudden we get Kid and Play in a big sink and all of a sudden everyone's talking about Kid and Play again on the internet or talking about right. um, 
the band and that really um, you know helps the catalog itself from my um, from the owner's standpoint and then of course you know we're also making the uh, the record company and the publisher money as well. I this is what I love about music publishing. Uh, as much as a mystery it is in some ways to a lot of people, uh, when you start to really unlock the mystery and understand what is going on in it, it's so much exciting things that you just sometimes may not have ever imagined. So when you started your company and you started representing people right off the bat, like a George Clinton, for goodness sake, I mean, when you have a catalog like that to work with, what is it that you as an agent is, are doing? Like w when you get it, what do you do? So um, first we do due diligence to make sure there's no uh, questionable issues with it. If it's hip hop, we really are scrutinize it in terms <laughs> of samples in terms of making sure it all aligns up because our reputation is everything. And if we're presenting music that we can't clear or that has um, an issue with it, then that is reflective on us. Um, so that's the first thing that we do. And then we, we look at it, we analyze it, we, we get the lyrics to it, we get translations to it. We take the time to figure out the right opportunities for it um, and make sure that we're targeting the right TV shows, the right movies, the right supers, the right video games, the right movie trailers. And as a team effort, you know, we'll discuss new projects and new artists and figure out you know, what makes sense. And it's important that you show a certain respect to a music super and that's if knowing that they do a certain show with a certain style that you're sending them um, music that's gonna work for that project. Um, and you sort of acknowledge that. And we don't take a shotgun approach, we take a very sniper approach to everything that, that we do. Yeah, so when you, when you actually are deciding to go look for placements for the songs in your catalog, um, what exactly these days, like, you know, I think a lot has changed in the world in the last 12 to 14 months between, you know, COVID and uh, social justice issues and political mayhem and <laughs> new regimes taking over and, it's a lot going on in the world. So are there some, a new perspective you have or are you looking and seeing new opportunities or anything different in the landscape for songs and the types of songs that people are looking for? Well, I think that um, as far as trends and stuff, I think all the publishers on the panel are experiencing um, a reduction in the TV world and in the film world just because production's not happening that as much in Hollywood and a lot of our focus is on video games, movie trailers um, and advertisements really. Um, in terms of trends, you know, sonically, um, I would say that Latin music has certainly um, stepped up and we're seeing um, today alone, there was three or four Spanish and Spanglish um, searches that came in that we were looking at in the ad world and working on. Um, and I would say definitely inspirational. Um, there's, you know, as we discussed, as I mentioned earlier, there's definitely an increase in that area. Mm -hmm. People want to use, um, you know, songs that are um, feel good and that um, have a sort of inspirational, positive vibe to it right now. Um, yeah, those are a few of the trends. I'm sure there's something else I'm missing that I'm not processing right now. <laughs> no worries. So if I'm a writer or producer and I want, you to represent me because I need somebody to go out there and be calling on video game companies and all of these places I didn't even know were looking for my music. Like, is that a thing or do I have to wait for you to find me as well? It's a good question. Um, it's a good question. Um, I would say that um, we have a pretty much full roster, but we're always looking for something that's happening and, and and that has um, some legs to it already. I would say I can't get enough female projects. Um, I would say I can't get enough sort of modern electro things that are not dance club, but that are more electro driven. Um, 
and you know songs that are happening if there's independent artists that all of a sudden have a little um have a little momentum and have some radio play locally or something then and a song could blow up then that's certainly of, of a lot of interest you know to us um as mm -hmm. a company um yeah yeah so I wanna I wanna make sure we have time for questions and I know we started a little late, so I'm adding like my extra little five minutes or so, but um definitely wanted you to at least touch on if you can, like some like a, a very exciting moment or two that you've seen, especially in gospel music with placements, because I know I I think we've done some kind of cool stuff together, but um you know, what, what have, have you seen anything like particularly um, opportunistic, something that maybe you didn't see before? Well, I think the growth of the Oprah Network, you know, alone mm -hmm. is, is definitely something that we've um, focused on and had conversations with and it put some songs um, in that area. Um, and I would just say um, there's a global presence in terms of, um, of of creating more awareness in inspirational music, and we had that campaign campaign together for the Beats by Dre, um, the headphones, and that's also something that there's a gospel choir that starts singing like in the commercial, and mm -hmm. um, and it happened to be you know a copyright that um, that we worked on. So sometimes um, things just fall into our lap, and we are reactive and. And we've earned that, you know, just because we're more in touch with people on a consistent basis, and and we feel we have really good, you know, brands and good good artists and things like that. Um, but a lot of it is just due to to the hustle, and um, mm -hmm. yeah, and and we actually are doing a few gospel projects ourselves right now, recording wise, that we think will be teed up well for sync. I mean, I can't really give you my creative ideas that I'm working on, but we do feel <laughs> no a, of, of growth and we do feel that um, if it's positioned creatively the right way and recorded um, the right way with the right songs, we know we can get it to the right supers that we think um, mm -hmm. will kind of um, check all their boxes. Yeah. Well, I love that you even mentioned it. We're not trying to get any secrets or any proprietary information, but just knowing that it's on the radar and that there are opportunities and places to integrate, not just if you're looking for a Beats ad, but even just wider array of places that content is being created for and platforms that um, hopefully everyone that's listening is hearing that there's so many opportunities for writers, producers, whatever your genre, whatever your style, because there's a lot going on, not only in the world, but with all of these new platforms that keep emerging daily uh, for exposure. Um, and we could do this all day. I know I'm gonna have to have a 2.0, a 3.0 <laughs> and other subparts. You guys are amazing. I don't want anyone to leave this without hearing one just last moment from each of you. So if you, and it's no order, so just jump in, but just, if you could just close by maybe giving uh, the audience whatever pearl of wisdom that you have for them, whether it has to do with, you know, a word of encouragement, if they are a gospel music industry creator or not, or just uh, for songwriters, producers, from a creative standpoint, even an executive standpoint, because I think you guys have given a lot of inspiration to people to see the myriad of careers that are also possible in this industry. So I'm gonna let you guys go with just a closing word as you would like it, and then cue up your questions. I, my chat's not moving. I don't see what the people are doing, but go ahead. <laughs> well, I'll jump in first. Um, I would just say, um, I think it's real important, no matter what, to, to dig in and learn as much as you can about the business. I think a lot of times across the board, whether you're a writer, artist, producer, or whatever, we fail to, you know, learn. And you have to continue studying because, it, I mean, everything changes continually. Um, but you, a lot of people will get into a place where they feel they know it all when they don't. Um, and it's, it's always room to learn, period. So always remain a student. Uh, and that's probably the... the, the the biggest thing I would, I, I always preach, learn, teach, you know, dig and study. Um, that's why it's great to be on platforms like this. Um, and then I also, another thing I think is real important, um, you know, as the opportunity comes, you know, if you do well and you succeed in this business, 
um, and, and afforded um, opportunities to do things outside of the music business or even within the business because there's ups and downs. There's, you know, there's mountains and valleys, um, no matter who you are in this business. So as we experienced this year uh, with COVID, I'm sure it hurt a lot of people in our industry and they didn't know what to do because they, you know, had no other form of income. Um, so I think it's real important when you have the opportunity to do something um, that will sustain whatever goes on in this world, make sure you do that. I'm gonna piggyback um, on what Fred said and uh, education is key. Um, find mentors in the business mm -hmm. and with the ability for online, you can take lots of classes um, at Berkeley College of Music, at my alma mater, NYU, um, out in the West Coast at the UCLA Extension School. There's a lot of introduction to music business classes, get mentors. And then on the opposite side, creativity, think out of the box, take chances. If you're hearing it on the radio, don't mimic it, take it to the next level, do something different, um, be an innovator, um, let people think you're, you're crazy, not boring. Hmm. I love that. <laughs> I just invented that. <laughs> I just hashtagged it, trademark it. <laughs> right? All the artists in the world have been innovators. I mean, all the icons through- Beethoven. <laughs> um, you're absolutely right about that. I would say education is key. I, I agree that's the most important thing you can do. Make, make contacts and, and learn how to collaborate with people learn how to offer up what you've got and to accept what they have and maybe find a good working relationship with people in various ways, could be business or the making of songs. Um, and, and keep at it because honestly, I can tell you, it takes a good three years for a songwriter to even get a cut, anything meaningful. And if you really believe it and you really have the passion, you just have to keep going. Um, and, and, these overnight sensations usually take 10 years. So, you know, believe in yourself and um, yeah, and be different. Mm. Randra, see, see, go ahead. Um, yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, creatives create. So always create, you know, in whatever way possible. So, you know, without you all, there's no us. So, you know, I, I always wanna keep the creators, the songwriters, the producers, the artists, at the forefront of things and, and make sure, you know, you're taking care of your mental health, uh, make sure you're, you know, just finding your space, you know, especially in today's times, but uh, always just create, you know, even when you ro run into a roadblock, create, 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 and find a way to create if you think you can't anymore. <laughs> um, and yeah, the education piece is, is everything and, and, and the relationships, build relationships, you know, uh, we have so many tools today uh, to, you know, with, with, with social media, with, you know, just everything in our phone, computer, uh, and when we get, when we get to get back and, you know, in face to face, that means everything as well. So I think relationships go and, and they're everything in this business. So um, cultivate those education and create. Love it. Brandra. Manage your money properly. Yes, come through. <laughs> I know we've all seen the horror stories where people think the same check that they got for their publishing deal will continuously come through every year and they come back very quickly for more money. And <laughs> chances are that may not happen. So please not just like save it, but properly manage it. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think that's exactly what Fred was talking about <laughs> with some of his earlier decisions, though, you know, a lot of money was coming in. So I am going to personally thank you all. We do have some questions. Uh, it's, yeah, we've, I think I want to give us about maybe five or 10 minutes, if you don't mind, uh, to just sort of address some of them. Um, so first of all, Fred Wilson is extremely uh, gracious and has sent a few through. I'm going to see, he said that many of you were talking about education and that it was important, but, you know, 
is a degree necessary? Because he was thinking about starting a program at Berkeley. It's not necessarily uh, necessary, but I know they have free courses, so I don't see why not take them while we're in quarantine if, if you want to learn more information. I particularly, I study music business at Columbia College in Chicago, but the main okay. reason why I went there was to establish relationships because I knew there will be a lot of like-minded individuals there and the goal was to not graduate. Like if you graduated, you were a flunky. That means you didn't make it to the music business in time. <laughs> so um, it just depends, but I don't, it's definitely not necessary unless you want to be an attorney. You know, <laughs> then it's kind of necessary. <laughs> I, I teach undergrad um, at Marymount Manhattan and I've also taught at Clive Davis at NYU. And the programs that these schools have are impressive and the guests that they bring in are excellent. Do you have to have a degree? No, but if, um, as Brandra said, if you can take that, uh, that education and network within your peers and also tap into the cities that you're based in for uh, internships and mentorships, then it you'll get a you'll get a job. You know when you graduate, and you definitely you know will get on the right path. And you have it up on someone else who's interviewing for the same position who doesn't have a music business degree. But the bottom line is, you need to be a music lover, a music head. You need to be passionate about all music, all genres, and just like be an encyclopedia of it. And that's the most important thing that, you know, a, a corporation or a label or a publisher or a management company will look. The degrees definitely uh, will help bring you to the next level, but you got to be a music, passionate about music for sure. Mm -hmm. That's something we all have common on this panel for sure. So, and I want to acknowledge Talisu said it wasn't really a question, but she was really grateful for all of the advice and thought that it was very helpful. So I want to make sure you guys know I'm not the only grateful person sitting here. Uh, so are our guests and, and the people watching. Um, someone said get a mentor. And we had a question, uh, how do you get a mentor and or a, even a manager? How do you even get them? So well, question I, I know that's a whole nother I think it's, a, it's more of an organic thing I think as you go along and you find people that you meet and you sort of like what they have to say or like how their career has unfolded that's a potential mentor it's not like there's a list you know of people that you can just go and, and interview to be a mentor it's more organic and you'll meet people along the way and and they'll Right. Cycle in and out of your life you know the somebody who was a mentor to me in my 20s is not the same person who's mentoring me now and um but i think that it's you can find that at schools for sure i mean you can find professors or people that guests speak at, at college classes um and i think it's just being knowledgeable seeing who's out there what they're doing if you think oh my goodness i i want to be a manager I don't know anything about it, but then you see the career of a couple of artists who've been successful, find out who their manager is. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's somebody you want to go and intern for, or, you know, just get to know. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to chime in on that just a little bit too. I think that um, what a lot of people don't realize is that really finding the mentor begins with the mentee. Um, you know, a lot of us are here and willing to answer questions or willing to, you know, field inquiries from serious people who want to know things. I mean, I think about, you know, one of my uh, biggest producer clients right now, I've known and represented for 20 years, and he started the conversation after a panel like this in person at Columbia College in Chicago, and just approached me and said, I just want to ask some questions. H how do I do that like if I just I want to know the business I want to be a producer and you know two weeks ago he's the number one billboard producer <laughs> in the mm -hmm. country so but just started with questions and and wasn't scared and he's actually done it his whole career just at, I mean no holds barred and if somebody doesn't want to give an answer he won't get it and I did the same thing even as coming up wanting to do entertainment law I would call entertainment lawyers and many of them wouldn't talk to me, <laughs> but some of them did. And so, 
yes, everyone on this panel is extremely busy. No, they, it's not like the door is just open for the floodgates of you know millions of people at once. However, you'd be surprised that you know how receptive people can be if you actually ask them questions or seek them out. Mm -hmm. uh, Darius Polk, hi, honey. Uh, do you automatically give up ownership of your master when dealing with the label? And if so, how do you avoid that? So real quick, master is another form of copyright. It's the sound recording copyright that he's talking about. So he's saying, if you have a record and you sign with the record company, do you have to give up ownership of the master or is there some other way around that? Well, that's the that was the traditional way of uh, getting a record deal, right? They pay you money to sign there, they pay for the making of the record and they own the masters. But now there are companies that do distribution only. You own the master, you license it to them for a period of time. Uh, the Orchard, STEM, AWOL, there's just a variety of, of companies who do that. So no, you don't have to give up your master. Yeah. But you're probably doing more work if, if you don't. Mm -hmm. Take more Great point. Great point and also great segue to a future uh, event that we're going to have because we will talk about record deals and licensing deals and all of that for master owners and uh, independents. So I am going to not hold any of you all any longer. I'm so grateful for the time. Can and I, the, Oh, Fred, come question? on, yes, Reno, Fred, please. He asked, he asked a question like, um, why wasn't my deal smart? And I just want to make sure it's, you know, it's clear. So it wasn't that it wasn't a smart deal. Um, you know, maybe not the smartest at the time for me, because I mean, everybody's situation is different. So um, when I did that first deal, I had already been working in, on a lot of records. So there was a lot of songs in the pipeline already that, um, that I took to that deal. Um, so I, it, it could have been structured in a different way, right? Um, but you, at the same time, you do have to understand um, the value that whatever type of deal, you know, that the publishing companies bring to the table. For example, uh, Brenda was saying earlier about how she likes to put different writers with, with different writers, right? You being, you know, if you're not with a, a publishing company, you might not have that opportunity to, to, to collab with somebody or meet somebody that's on her roster. So it's stuff like that is, you know, can, can, can amount to be very big in, in your career. So understand the value with being with a company that can put you with somebody else. Um, technically, you know, I don't know how much, what they do it anymore. Um, but again, publishing companies, you know, really are supposed to help you get work, try to get your songs placed, which, you know, I didn't need help with that at all. Um, <laughs> zero, uh, which is crazy. So it made, it made my guy, you know, it made him happy. He didn't have to work. So, but that's not everybody's story. But the benefit of having somebody that can help pitch your songs or put you in um, great collaborations is definitely worthwhile. So don't avoid um, a co-pub if you need it or, or admin deal if you need it. But you should definitely use something without a question. I'm, I'm, I appreciate you making that clarification. I often say that there's all of these uh, war stories you hear or people tell their story and they say, oh, I had a horrible deal or a situation wasn't great. And you're right, they never explain it. And, um, and so I'm, I'm appreciative that you put it in context and Absolutely. especially from time, place, circumstance and, and otherwise. So that, that is great. At With that deal, I was able to, um, that deal afforded me to purchase, um, you know, by way of a down payment, my first piece of real estate, which, is, which was a shopping center, which again, gave me income for years and years and years. So again, you gotta, you the know- jerk you, is. you said you your first grad. piece of real estate was a, was a mall? Not a mall, a little shopping center. <laughs> shopping center, that's awesome. Not a mall. But I'm saying, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a one bedroom condo? <laughs> no, actually it wasn't, is that crazy? So it's important, it's important, I mean, that, that again, when you, when you get these advances or whatever, make them work, make it work for you, I think, because a lot of times we work backwards. Anybody who knows me, like I was, you know, I was still in the frugal guy, um, even though I, I'll treat myself every now and then, but I'm the guy that goes to a restaurant and say, are, 
well, I don't drink soda anymore, but when I did, are those Diet Cokes, are there free refills? You know, because I'm like, oh, why am I giving you extra money? I'm not going to sit. I drink a lot of soda, so I don't want to give you 20. That I was, you know, but um, but again, I think it's just important that you set yourself up. If you're going to get an advance, don't get it to blow it. Set it up to set you up, you know, so. Can I tell on Fred a little bit? One quick story. Come on, y'all. I, I don't have anywhere else to be, but I, you know, but we can I, do this. And if anyone else does, please feel free. But we let's do the after no, show. Come no, on. No, yeah. just really quick, fun story. Uh, Fred, my in my past uh, or earlier music career, I could say I was a tour manager, and Fred picked us up in the airport when we came to do a gig in this city in a Bentley. In my first time being in the Bentley. Uh, Thank you, Fred. Bentley or Rose? Excuse me. Uh, was it the, what color was it? It was the rose, I believe. A uh, white one? Yep, it was a white one. Got you. Got yeah, one. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, you know, your advances were, were nice and gave me a great experience. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but again, that, and, and again, when I bought that car, I justified it. Now, I had made a prior. I bought a car in 99. It was all, and I still have it to this day. It was almost a half a million dollars. And it only has 13,000 miles on it. But, you know, I was holding on to it to become a classic. So, you know, I just checked the value on it, the, not that particular one. And it's only one of five in the world. So it became an investment. Uh, and I bought, didn't I see in the last year or two, you bought, I think it was your father or your father-in-law, a very special vehicle. Yeah, I bought my father a Bentley, right? Because, you know, again, my father my father managed me and Rodney. He got older and he doesn't manage us anymore. So he ended up getting rid of his Bentley. And then he, he you know, he like regretted. He always talked about his Bentley. So I went and bought him like the same color and everything. I bought my mom. I just bought her an S class. They older and they start switching up and then they do things that they don't like. So I bought her S class, and but that's what it was. I mean, I can't take it to heaven. So number one, I'm getting on your Christmas list. I'm getting on your Christmas list. Number two, I need to put up a Christmas tree this year. <laughs> I'm still. Hence, you have more to do other than that. So I'm going to get it on your Christmas list. And then I'm going to do what Fred Wilson has said, because he said he wants you to be his mentor. So do I. <laughs> I need to start writing and stop all this talking. Anybody else? Because I don't want to cut anyone off short. Okay. You guys, amazing. Uh, grateful. So many words. Uh, I created the Soul Reciprocity Network to be a company that helped artists and companies and people to develop their brands and to understand who they are and what the purpose is of what they're doing before they go out and seek uh, partnerships or what it is they need to do to be great and arm them with tools and resources, including education and including personal resources that are custom fit so that they're fulfilling and work. And you guys are a completely perfect example of why I created the edutainment component of this company because this is just priceless. It's so needed. And while there's a lot of conferences and panels and things, you guys have been on them all. Um, this has a little bit of a different flow and a little bit of a different angle and purpose. We will be editing. My producers will edit this. It will be housed at soulreciprocitynetwork.com. Uh, we will take little gems and factoids and wonderful pearls that you've given us so that we can recirculate and share. So, uh, and we will do more of these as well as, like I said, some one-on-ones and some other interesting things. So thank you for giving your time. Thank you for being reciprocal to the industry that's been so good to each of you. And thank you all for coming to episode two. Thank we you, Heather. It. Thank, thank you. you, Heather, and your staff. Yeah. We your appreciate it. Also, we love you guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Heather.